Hey everyone, and welcome back to another installment of the Travel and Tourism Podcast, my first season. My guest today worked for Club Med from 2004 to 2006, and his first season was in Club Med Kristen Butte as a ski instructor. He is a graduate of Penn State University with majors in management and international business with a minor in French. Ooh la la! While at Penn State, he was a member of the fencing team and won two NCAA championships with the team. He's from Pennsylvania, but has been living in my favorite country in the world, Australia, for the last 17 years, and we'll ask him how the heck that happened. Please help me welcome to the show, Matt Gillig. Hey, Matt, how are you, sir? Yeah, I'm well, thanks, Greg. How are you? I'm good, good. Now, before we go on, I got to shout out someone who referred me to you. So she's a recruiter extraordinaire. So shout out to Shahima Arshad for uh, introducing us. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Shahima. Yeah, yeah. What I've been say, in touch Matt? with her recently. Yeah, well, you know, she sang your praises, so that's why you're here, sir. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, it's good. She said you'd be charming, so no pressure, okay? <laughs> I, I hope I can deliver. I hope I can deliver. She sets the bar pretty high. That's right. <laughs> that is true. Now, we're going to get into the Australia thing here in, in a minute, but uh, like, I, I am curious about you know Penn State and being on the fencing team. So how, how does someone, like growing up, were you into swashbuckling movies? Like, how, how does it work? How does someone get into fencing rather than like basketball or baseball? When I was, I don't know, I guess when I was a little kid, I really just, for whatever reason, I was drawn to like, you know, things like Robin Hood and stuff and just really wanted to to try fencing. We found a program at the YMCA in, in Pennsylvania, in York. Yeah, I was able to just jump into it at 10. And I think the... I was like four years too young to join it, but they they let me do it and then met my first coach there. And I guess kind of the rest is history. Just got into the the traveling and the competing and the the you know, I guess the the actual sport of it, more so than the the theatrical side. Yeah. It opened it opened up a lot of doors for, you know, traveling, meeting new people, really just really was responsible for me catching that that sort of travel bug. Is fencing as hard as it looks? I think it's harder. Okay. I was, I was <laughs> like, I was, I was a pretty good fencer, but I was a driving range pro, if you know what I mean. Like, I had good in practice, but you know, just couldn't couldn't put it together consistently for for big tournaments. Yeah, that's where you see a lot of these guys and and girls that are just amazing and consistent, and they just they they have this mindset that they can just turn it on and and just just deliver. But yeah, that wasn't that wasn't my my experience with it. But yeah, it is it's very hard mentally and yeah, kind of hard physically. You come out some days and you're just absolutely exhausted. And how's it feel winning a, an NCAA championship? It must be special, no? Yeah, it's I mean, it feels pretty good. Like we were at, at Penn State the fencing team, so I had I got there in in 2004 or sorry, 2000. Yeah. Yeah, no, sorry, 90, 1999. And come off the back of the, the team that season, the, the 99-2000 season, so my freshman year, the the last of six consecutive NCAA titles that the team had won. So coming into Penn State, we had a really good reputation as a pretty, you know, pretty good team. And yeah, it's just like it felt kind of cool to to be part of that and to, you know, have, have the respect and, and just you know, get comments from people that played football, people that played basketball, you know, some of these these more popular sports. I mean, Penn State's got a tremendous wrestling program and a tremendous volleyball program and that was it was kind of cool to be to be up there, you know, kind of uh with with these these really really good athletes as well. Yeah, it was nice. That was, was a long it? time ago though. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. While you were at Penn State, was it here that you found out that your dad's co-workers' kids were ski instructors for Club Med in the 80s? Like, or was this like before or after Penn yeah. State, I should say? So the, so the last year I was at Penn State, so I, I was a, um, I was on the super senior plan up there. So um, my my degrees were four and a half year degrees and I redshirted as a, as a freshman. And so I, I got to fence for essentially five years with and compete for four. Can you explain yep. red shirting for our Canadian? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. So red shirting is an option within the NCAA that allows you to basically sit out a year, train with the team, uh, and not lose a year of your 
competitive eligibility. So every NCAA athlete has four years of competitivity. Yeah, four a four year competitive window. Red shirting allows you to to basically if you if you you know feel like you need to develop a bit more or you know train a bit more you know a lot of a lot of football players will redshirt their freshman year to put on weight and get familiar with the programs and and things like that. All right, back to the dad coworkers kids. At yes. point you talk to your dad and he says, "Hey, my uh, my coworkers kids were ski instructors in the eighties. Is that what happened?" Yeah, I mean it's it's funny. Like on a whim, my my last year at Penn State, I decided to to teach skiing as a kind of a winter job. And I thought you know, we had a there was a small hill outside of Penn State University called Tussie Mountain, and it's like it's it's maybe 100 meters vertical sort of thing. But they had you know they had a decent little training program for ski instructors. I really enjoyed it, so I you know got hired and and taught a season at that mountain and kind of you know really got into into the teaching and and did my you know went up to Vermont did my level one at the end of the season and and. So, you know, found some other instructors and thought, oh, wow, this is people actually do this for for a living. And that's when I started to look at, you know, maybe how I could how I could do that. And uh, that's when my dad goes, you know, I had some friends that had kids that worked for Club Med back in the 80s. And they had they were instructors. And so it was the first time I actually heard of Club Med. And that's when I that's when I submitted my application that that summer yeah, got got the I guess the interview slash audition up in New Jersey. Yeah, which was an experience. That was that was a lot of fun. But yeah, so that's that was kind of where I I found out about Club Med. Okay, and they send you to uh, Crested Butte in December of two thousand four. So I'm guessing you arrive mm-hmm. before Christmas. You have Joey Templin as your chief of yep. village, correct? That's correct. Yeah. So Joey was the the chief of village. Yeah. What did we? So the the first. The first day was really interesting. I mean, we all met in the like the Denver airport and there was like a big sign and just people coming in from all different flights. A lot of people from, you know, coming in from Canada, a lot of people coming in from Montreal. And then it's like a four hour bus ride down to down to Crested. I had no idea what to really expect, but we got in at like, I don't know. 11 o'clock or midnight and I meet my roommates and you know we talk for a little bit and then just everybody's just really quite tired and so you know then the next day it's down to uh down to the the village and yeah we get on snow or did some some orientation things like that you meet more people I mean it was it was really quite interesting and there were only maybe two or three days before we had the guests start to arrive quite fuzzy on that at the moment like <laughs> again i'm thinking back it's this was now 20 years ago but yeah it was just it was a lot of fun uh, yeah don't say of, that you know 2004 for that me rush fairly, right away yeah no 2004 is fairly recent for me so when you when you put it in terms like 20 years yeah it does oh boy it does sound wow. a, a long time ago oh wait are you saying the closest airport to crescent was four hours away no it was the the biggest Oh, okay, got it. So okay. yeah, so there there was an airport in Gunnison, which is about a half hour south of Crested Butte, but not a lot. You 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 know you take like a small charter plane or you know just like a little of jumper or something in into that airport, and so people would fly into into Gunnison and come up to to Crested Butte to stay with us. But uh, yeah, I think the you know for for GOs and for the club, it was e- it was cheaper to to fly them out to Denver and then hire a bus to take us to. Um, Take us up to the village. Well, what do you remember about that first week? Any any culture shock? Any anything go wrong? Anything go right? I just like I remember just meeting a lot of different people from around the world, you know, and and I don't I don't don't think anything went wrong or right, but I I really didn't know what to expect and was just kind of you know kind of blown away by just everybody was there. Everybody was really social, really friendly. You know, we all had this, you know, we were all there for, for very similar reasons. Yeah, I remember, I guess the the, the cultural shock was the uh, the crazy signs. Like nobody had really ever, you know, discussed crazy signs with me or mentioned them. And so, you know, doing doing hands up for the first couple of times was, yeah, was really interesting. Well, you had, uh, <laughs> in, in, I think at Penn State, your college roommate was Ozzy, was an Australian and Joey 
Templin is from Australia, so I guess yeah, uh, I guess there wasn't much Aussie culture shock there, right? <laughs> no, there, there. I mean, there wasn't much, much Aussie culture shock. But uh, Joey was a Joey was a really good chief to, chief of village. Like he was, um, really energetic and just a lot of fun to kind of be around. He, you know, he he set a he set a pretty good culture for that season, I think. And you know, one of the one of the skiers. One of the ski school assistant directors was Shannon Brown, who's also from Australia. And so, you know, we started talking quite a bit, Shannon and I, and yeah, then started meeting all the, all the other instructors. We had a, you know, Brazilian contingent of instructors. We had you know, heaps of Canadians. Yeah. And people, you know, seasoned veterans that had done seasons at, at Copper Mountain and then at Crested Butte, because, you know, it, I guess Crested had been open for a few years at that stage. So yeah, it was. I mean, I had some some good people teach me teach me the ropes right away. My roommates that first season was a guy. One was a guy named Jason Dunning who had done some seasons in in Crested and in Copper. He was from Alabama and had moved out to Colorado when he was I don't know, twenty or something like that. And he'd been out there for a long time. And then our other roommate was a guy named Robel who um, yes, grew up in the states. Yeah, no, I, yeah, Robel, who famously became part of the Ethiopian ski team, right, in the Olympics? Yeah, yeah, I think he did two Olympic games for Ethiopia uh, yeah. with cross country, cross country skiing. Yeah, that yeah. was pretty interesting. Yeah, so it was, it was, yeah, it was really fun with those guys. Um, I remember doing some running with Robel, and you know, the village out there at Crested is at 9,000 something feet above sea level. So you, you're busting your lungs. But yeah, it was it was pretty good. I, I kept up. I don't, uh, I can't say I've, I've ever tried cross-country skiing, but um, I could keep up with it. I could keep up with him on a jog. Yeah, it's not, it's not <laughs> yeah. so easy. It's not so easy cross-country, right? I mean, when you're used to downhill, cross-country is hard, <laughs> right? I, yeah, that's, I mean, it just... It looks like a it looks like a really inefficient way to go from point A to B, right? Like it's <laughs> yeah. uh it's like swimming the butterfly. But yeah, it was uh, you know th those guys were a lot of fun. And then Shahima lived across the hall with was it Michelle Flynn was over there as well. We we became friends. You know they had they had a nice like drink set up. So after we'd come off the mountain, we'd go there have a drink or two and just hang out. And then we'd go down for dinner. You know, that's when we were back entertaining the guests and having the shows at night. And just, yeah, it was, you didn't do much sleeping at Crested Butte. I don't think he did much sleeping in general at Club Med. That was okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I am jealous about one thing that happened to you to this season, like extremely jealous. However, Shahima's story, Kenny Loggins changed part of the song lyrics, but you carried... Kenny Loggins' luggage, and I would have killed to have done that, Mister Danger Zone. Yeah, yeah. How big a are you as big a Top Gun fan as me? Look, I I, I do like Top Gun. I thought that the sequel was was pretty adequate. It was just like uh, you know, he he had songs from I think he you know what was it from from uh um, oh, Caddyshack Caddyshack Footloose. yeah yeah, yeah Footloose. <laughs> I mean, this guy he was he was the 1980 soundtrack king, and so checking him into the hotel, I was kind of I was a bit starstruck. You know, sure. when some, yeah, and, and then um, what was really funny, and I don't know if anybody's anybody's had this this story on on the podcast, but uh, so that was Country in the Rockies, which was an annual event that you know, a, you know, country artists would come out, they'd do workshops and they'd sing songs uh, and hold concerts and stuff at night, and it was they'd rent out the whole village, and so there were no other guests that week. And basically, the geos would make themselves scarce during the week. It was just they they wanted the space to to you know to work on things, yeah, and just kind of be be without any sort of you know any other distractions. But they would hold concerts at night, and we could go up to the mezzanine in the theater at Crescent Butte, and so we were all up there. Kenny Loggins was putting on a concert, and he had just sung. I think maybe he did some footloose or something like that. And he was going to slow it down a little bit. And so he was telling this story about, about this song he did called, I think it's called down on Pooh corner. And he wrote the song for his son, you know, when they were, when him and his wife were going through a divorce or something, something like that. And so it was, he was telling the story about how he wrote the song and, and where it came from. And, and one geo, I won't, I'm not going to say the name, but 
you know, just out of nowhere, just screams, danger zone. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you get that. So it was a record scratch moment. Everybody kind of looks up. <laughs> and, you know, it's it's a dark theater. Nobody can really see the mezzanine. We all look over and he just turns and looks at us, goes, what? Danger zone. It was so, yeah, it was really funny sort of after the fact. But yeah, during during it was, yeah, yeah you had you to know, really you, stifle your laughter. Yeah, well, you got to read the room too, right? I mean, if he was, <laughs> if he was doing yeah. Footloose, then, you know, okay, then you yell out danger zone. But maybe, mm. I don't know, <laughs> maybe not during yeah. uh, the song that meant a lot yeah. to Kenny Loggins, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, it was, that was funny. I mean, we were all, we were all fairly young, I suppose. <laughs> but yeah, it was Ah, uh, it was good. That was a that was a really funny moment that season. You have any other memories from that uh, season, Matt? Yeah. So, coming from the East Coast, I never like I had grown up skiing, but I never had the chance to ski, you know, really deep, dry snow. And so, the first season in Crested Butte, I, this must have been early January. We were watching this storm. Some of the some of the guys that had been out there for years started watching this storm come up through through California. And in you know, what they said was that um it would uh this this it would just dump in California and then we'd get what was left over. And what was awesome about that was that they were they were right. And so like, you know, places like Tahoe got, I don't know, five, six feet or twelve feet or something like that in about a week. We get I think three or four feet. Anyway, the first day off that we had was like after the storm had passed, you know, like it had passed on like a Tuesday night and we were off on Wednesdays. And so the ski school, everybody was just strapped on skis and went out. It was, I mean, I had never skied anything like that. It was just, I mean, it just, it would part around you as you're skiing through it. It was just amazing. It was so much fun. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was great. I think like the some of the shows that year were pretty funny. Like the ski show we did was really good. There was a there was a cabaret show which was a lot of fun. And they, for whatever reason, some of the the ski instructors and I was one of them. We dress up in it was like a bit of a drag, and um, we were hideous, <laughs> absolutely hideous on stage. But we had a yeah, you know, we had a lot of fun dancing to um oh gosh, I think it was I think it was cabaret from from the musical. So that Willkommen and Bienvenue Welcome. Yeah, oh, yeah. but we, yeah, we did show, yeah. we did yeah, we did not make very attractive very attractive ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of that, because like I, I noticed something interesting in, in your timeline. Now I've come to learn that most ski instructors kind of take the summer off and do other things they don't necessarily go to a summer village like you did mm. in in may of 2005 you went to punta cana as a land sports geo so so did you specifically ask to go to punta or that's just where they wound up sending you because you wanted to do land sports yeah i was just i i talked to i think it was kate ferguson in the miami office and they had a they had an opening. I was really curious about a summer village at the time, and they said, "Yeah, Punta Cana is a good one. You can you can do land sports down there." And I thought, oh, "All right, that sounds pretty good." And some of the some of the other other geos had said, "Yeah, land sports is a is a lot of fun. It's a great it's a great job for you know when, if you can get it in the villages, it's a lot of fun. You just basically play games all day." So yeah, I uh, I took. Took that, and a couple weeks, a couple weeks after the season in Crested Butte, I was on a plane down to, down to Punta Cana, and yeah, spent the summer down there, playing games. Like it was, I mean, it, I mean, it was great. Like, um, you know, the the only thing you have to really do is be on time and and be, you know, kind of you know, be jovial. My days began, I think, at like, I think it was like an eight thirty power walk. Then nine thirty. Okay, excuse me, Matt. One was, second. Oh. What, what, what did you think mm -hmm. of the power walk? Did you like it? I yeah, I had fun with it. I did have. I, yeah, it was you know because it, it's it's kind of a big village, Punta Cana, I guess. And so you know within within the grounds, you've got maybe about a mile, mile and a half of you know sort of walking track from you know one far end of the one far end of the village to the other. So I would um 
I would incorporate some plyometrics and some lunges and things in there from from my sporting background. Yeah, kind of put the guests through their paces, and you, you judge the group, I suppose. Wait, are you and, saying you, you made them do lunges on the power walk? Darn, you're yeah, hardcore. Yeah, well, it's a, a power walk, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, yeah, I know everyone who knows me knows I didn't really get, take a shine to power walk or water aerobics. Uh, so <laughs> speaking of, did you have to do water aerobics? I did. Yeah, the, the aqua gym was. Did you, did was, you learn? Did you learn there? Someone teach you? Yeah, someone someone taught me. So I learned who was my the 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 land sport. The chief of land sport was a was a French girl named Amandine, and then. I had a another land sport geo who was a partner. He was he's actually from Montreal or from Quebec, uh, Alexi Alexi Menard, and they they kind of showed me the ropes with with what the activities were. I had played volleyball in high school and played soccer and stuff like that, and so I I was able to to kind of run run with those, you know, without without much prompting. But yeah, the water sports was uh sorry the water water aerobics I I. I was an apprentice for about a week or two before they let me before they let me run with it. But yeah, it was it was hilarious. Like, you know, you, we'd get the the DJ, the you know, the entertainment team would come down and set up a DJ booth with these big speakers and it was just, you know, from I don't know, ten thirty or eleven o'clock in the morning until the afternoon. It was just yeah, just a party down there. <laughs> House music and yeah, and a lot of fun. Your chief of villages this season is Philippe Abraham, but you also have a promo CDV, a friend of mine, Eduardo Duda Carvalho. Yeah, so, yeah I, I I worked with with Duda, you know, a great guy from from Brazil, and then mm. I think there's a CDV change later in the season, right, with Abdul Osman. Yeah, yeah. So that's when Abdel came in. Uh, that was it. Would have been like August or September uh, of that year. Yeah. Duda and then Philippe, I mean, it was it, because it's such a big village, I guess they, they had the, the deputy chief. And so they'd split the duties and, and, you know, kind of manage the village that way. I think there was room for three, maybe probably about 3000 guests, I guess. If it was at, if it was at full capacity, it was quite a big village. I'm going to ask you, did you find you worked harder the summer season than you did in Crested or no? So I yes, and the the reason why is that summer villages you don't have the guests out doing physical activity all day at altitude, and so you know they they come down they'd hang by the pool they'd drink they'd sleep maybe they'd play some sports or go you know in go scuba diving or windsurfing or whatever but they weren't active all the time and because it was a sea level they they could keep their energy levels up so what happens at Crested is that everybody would go to bed before go to bed after the show and then the bar at night would just be full of geos who, you know, who have, who've adjusted. I crested the first week I got there. I think I, I didn't leave the village until about 1130 or midnight every night and would be fast asleep before I could even open my door to my, my room. That was for me, that was an adjustment because it was like sports all day and through the night and then shows and, it was um like it was once once I got over that you know once I got over that that adjustment it was like awesome it was such a good summer but yeah it took a it took a bit <laughs> to get there and I guess you were happy to go back to Crested in uh, December of two thousand five then right yeah yeah so with um with going back to Crested you know I was going back I had a lot of friends going back as well that season. So it was, you know, I kind of knew what to expect, I, you know, looking forward to, to, you know, just more and more skiing with, with people I really liked. And, and, um, you know, a lot of the guys that, that I worked with in Punta Cana were ski instructors and they all did the sailing, you know, they were all sailing geos in Punta Cana. And, you know, so, so to, to, basically go you know kind of travel and work with them for for a year and a bit was was really cool so yeah i was yeah very excited to go back in in 2005 all right now you're with my favorite guy uh chef de village ryan leach okay so mm. uh great california guy 
And you're, I see that you're, so you have a, don't have a chief of sports in Winter Villages, you have a chef de service. So I see you're back with, uh, is it Gilles? Uh, I don't know how you pronounce his last name. How do you pronounce Gilles' last name? I don't want to. That's a great question. I want to say, is, I want to say like. Where, where's he from? Maybe that's, I can... he's, so he's, he's from Belgium. Belgium, uh, so okay. Gilles, yeah. Okay, I see. Yeah, so so I, 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 I know I'm not going to be able to pronounce that. <laughs> <laughs> wait, yeah, wait, yeah. Wait, what, wageners, wageners. <laughs> Sorry, Jill. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> Jill. It's, it's, a, it's a it's it's a tough one. I would. Yeah, I'm not even gonna. I don't, if you I don't said if you said it, but, uh, if you said Swiss, I would have taken a crack at it. Well, as soon as you said Belgium, I, I started backing away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. Uh, yeah. So Jill was the uh, Jill was the the chief of ski out there. Shahima was uh, an assistant chief of ski, and then. We had another another assistant, and I'm going to draw a blank on his name, but he's from Quebec. He was hilarious, Matthew Gautier. He was, yeah, this guy. He like he really good bump skier. God, he could he would just like just hop from bump to bump. He was beautiful skier to watch, and one of the funniest, like just naturally funniest guys I've ever met. Like just really quick with with a you know either a joke or a punchline and then facial expressions to kind of just to match it like i don't think i've ever laughed as hard as i had you know with anybody else in, in club med was it like he was just he was so funny so you're um, saying he could have been an animator absolutely he yeah he had all the he had all the tools to be an animator but he was an absolute gun of a skier so <laughs> yeah well tell yeah about, so that tell year, me about this season yeah, so I mean, it was interesting going back, you know, kind of having the second season in the mountains and and knowing what to expect, and you know, being I guess at that stage being a, a veteran in you know sort of air quotes. That was like I knew the town a bit better. Uh, I knew the the other instructors from the the Crested Butte Resort Ski School, and so it was it was fun to to kind of work with those guys. I mean, you know, we we still like. I don't know, there were there were a, a group of instructors from from Club Med that were still trying to pursue their their levels in kind of advancing in, in ski instruction. So we set up this like kind of just joint training thing with with the Crested Butte Ski School guys, and like it was really nice. Like you know we'd go out on like Thursdays and, and ski with them and and do a couple of lessons here and there and then do some video analysis and stuff like you know kind of kind of ski school nerd stuff, which was I enjoyed it. It was it was really good on the on the club med side. It was yeah, I think that year was we didn't get the we didn't get the snow. The geo team was like they were again they were a lot of fun and it was yeah it was a it was a good year. It was I don't recall too many sort of sort of events or anecdotes. I mean we had I think we partied a lot that year as you do. One of the yeah one of the um one of the, the really cool memories from that season was actually, so instead of country in the Rockies that year, we had the Carter foundation come out. And so that was Jim, uh, former president, Jimmy Carter's, I guess, one of his charitable organizations. And I got to, to meet him. So he was, he was just in the lunch line and the buffet line one day. And I was behind him and just struck up a conversation, um, talked about habitat for humanity, which he, you know, he, had been involved in up until I think even like two or three years ago, he's 99 or something like that. Now talk to him. Talk, I had finished a book that he had just released earlier that year. I actually had the book out in, in my room at, at Crested Butte. So later in the week when I saw him again, I had the book and I, I actually got him to, to sign the book for me, which was really cool. So I still have that book today. Excuse me, Matt. Did, yeah. Did you... Did you know he was going to be there when you before you left for Crested? No, they. I mean, they they announced the. You, know, you kind of know who who the guests are and where they're coming in from about like a week in advance or so. No, I, I mean, I mean, I'm, no, I mean, sorry, but like oh. you you went home between Punta and Crested, right? Yeah. Like okay, so while you were home, did yeah, you couple... find out Jimmy Carter was going to be there? No, no. So you're saying you were just traveling, like so a happenstance, you just happened to have the book and then you traveled with it, and then then you find out, oh my god, I have his book and he's coming to the village. Is that how it happened? Yeah, more or less. Like um the wow. Yeah, it I mean uh, it was interesting. Like I back then I would um 
I would have my parents send me out, you know, back issues of the economist. <laughs> I'd have like, you know, just a couple of these care packages come through, you know, every, every few weeks. Okay. But yeah. Let's just, re re taken sorry, out, excuse yeah. me, Matt, excuse me. Yeah. Let's just remind our readers that your major is in management and international business. So when I yeah. went to Clement guys, I had us weekly, and, but, but Matt is smart. So this is why he reads, you know, books by uh -huh. ex presidents and, <laughs> and international business. Uh, I guess, but I, you, did you ever bump into a geo with similar reading habits? I don't think so. Right. Uh, yeah, I think there were, there were a few, you know, I would, I'd, throw Shahima and, and Sue's Rappaport out there in, in terms of having similar reading habits. Uh, Michelle Flynn works for, uh, I want to say Canada Export Bank at the moment and has worked for them for quite a long time. So there were a couple of geos that, you know, I would work with that, you know, were, were what would you say? They were pursuing, well, you know, well read, well read. Yeah. Well read, I guess would be the, the way to put it. Yeah. Then they, you know, we played a lot of trivia Trivial Pursuit? With, trivial Pursuit, yeah. Pub trivia, that sort of thing. We we played a lot of or the the Australian is is really coming out now. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, we're we're get we're gonna get there. Uh, just another question. Yeah. So when he, when he signed your book, mm -hmm. did he sign thirty nine anywhere? I'd have to go take a look at it. It's okay. been it's it's on my bookshelf downstairs. It's been years since I've actually opened it up. But um, downstairs, well, yeah. that should be in a vault. What are you doing? Come on, man. Mm. That's signed by the oh, president, well, it's... number thirty nine. <laughs> yeah. We it locks up. We got a key. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's not something yeah. you, you put you put out for guests, you know, on your coffee table. Yeah. You know, like okay, as long as you're yeah. protecting it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> He's got a Nobel Peace Peace Prize for gosh sakes. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he no, uh, he was uh, he was an interesting guy, and, and look, it was um, yeah. So that was that was one of the highlights of the season, and I think some of the you know just some of the others were just yeah, being out there, knowing you know having a having a group of friends, you know that that I had other experiences with in Club Med, and you know, just you had you had that that confidence, and so you you know the shows were I think even goofier. The crazy signs were were that much more fun. Yeah, we just we had a blast that season. the The sad thing was that they closed down Crested Butte after that season, and I think they made the announcement in May or June of that year, so in in two thousand six. And so we were, you know, everybody had left at that stage, and you know, we we find out through I think it was just like reading news site or an email or something like that and you just go had we known that they were going to close that resort down we might have you know kind of kind of taken it taken it all in a bit more and and just yeah maybe stayed up a little bit later or uh you know done you know one or two more one or two more days on the snow sort of thing or you know, runs per day that's it just really really kind of kind of enjoyed it a lot more yeah it was a great village it was sad that they that they closed that one down yeah, you were offered a, a sports role at Jerba at one of uh, I don't know if it was Jerba La Douce or Lef or Jerba La Fidel in Morocco for uh, summer summer '06, but you I believe you turned down to teach skiing in Argentina. Yeah, yeah, the um, yeah, I got the the offer for Jerba. I can't remember which one it was either, but um, like it was pretty exciting. But at that stage, I was really just into the, into skiing, and one of one of the other geos and I. This is uh, JT Williams. We were we were just we had been talking all season about going to South America, and you know I said, all right, let's let's do it. And uh, so we we basically we committed to going to South America for that season. Found ourselves in Bariloche in Argentina, which okay. was yeah, it was it was really cool. Well, I want I want to work up to where you meet your wife. So is it after this mm. you go work with a few XGOs at Big White in yes. British Columbia? That's correct. Yeah. So after after the season in South America, I, you know, so one of the geos that I was really good friends with from two seasons at Crested and one season in, in Punta Cana, a guy named Christian Armstrong, he he had gone to work at Big White the last season Crested Butte was open. So, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So he was at Big White the year before I went up there. And in the summertime when I was in Argentina, we were emailing back and forth and he you know, he put me in touch with the head of the ski school and I, you know, sent them my, my CV, which was kind of funny for a ski instructor to have a CV, but sent him, sent him the CV and 
got offered a job to teach a big white for that for the upcoming season. So I yeah moved up to big white, and there were there were a number of other GOs, ex GOs from you know from the club that were teaching up a big white, and uh, yeah, so kind of you know got into got into a couple of, you know I guess a pretty pretty good network of ex GOs. One of them was having a having a party. And that's that was where I met my wife. So it was like the second night of her holiday. She was friends with somebody that was working at the central reservations desk. And they knew the the assistant ski school director who was an ex geo. And so I got him yeah, we showed up we showed up late. Yeah, it was it was just random, a very random little party. And then a couple nights later, I saw her at a bar, and we started talking, and just really hit it off. And uh, yeah, I'm, I've been in Australia now seventeen years. Okay, so she's Australian. From where? Yes. So she grew up in Sydney. She was born in Tehran. Grew up in Sydney. Her family emigrated back in the eighty eight or eighty nine. But yeah, for, you know, formative years in in Sydney. And yeah, so we live in Sydney now, and yeah, very okay. very close. Well, let's to where talk she, about she Australia, up. yeah, because so mm. now now we get some culture shock because the first time you go live there is totally different mm. than meeting someone. So you know they they shorten mm. words. There's Aussie English dictionaries. There's the seven deadliest animals in the world that are there. Uh, <laughs> well, I guess the first year is kind of you're, you're adjusting, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it was a big adjustment, right? I think the biggest one was that you get to a place that's outside of this this Club Med microcosm. You know, Club Med was was great because everybody comes together. Everybody's there for for a purpose. They're there for a short time, and they're all on the same they're all on the same sort of page. So you make friends really quickly. You you know make good friends really quickly. You you everybody's very social. You go. You know, you're quite active and there's always something to do. When I moved here, the challenge was was really making friends, you know, and this this sort of timeline being extended from several months to, well, you know, now 17 years. And so the, you know, I, the first couple of first couple of months I had moved down here, I moved on and I came down on a on like a tourist visa. So I, I wasn't able to work legally. And I found some found some work coaching fencing under the table with one of the the university clubs down here, and so that basically paid for my you know gave me something to do a couple of nights a week and sort of paid for my transport back and forth from the city to to where we were living. And then when I you know there was this this big it was Australia Australia Pacific sort of partner summit I think it was APAC and. I can't remember what the the acronym stands for, but uh, I think it was Asia Pacific of, and yeah, something summit. Out of that summit came a, a reciprocal work agreement between the U.S. and Australia. So Canadians have that that sort of work holiday visa with Australians, and that's why you know there's so many Canadians in uh, in Whistler and and other places. Or sorry, there's so many Australians uh, in those places. Yeah, sorry. So so that was so I started working as soon as I was able to get that visa. And I have been, yeah, you know, working down here in, you know, number of different roles and with a number of different companies ever since. Interesting. Yeah, A yeah, APEC. I think it's Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, something like that. Is that right? Sound yeah, right? something like that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now you mentioned a lot of names of people. You know, we've heard names before in the podcast. Mm -hmm. I don't want to leave anyone out. Is there anyone else that you enjoyed working with? You had a good time with. I mean, there were there were tons of people. Like I'd say, yeah, Christian Armstrong, Kyle Armstrong, no relation. Kyle and his brother Brent were, yeah, absolutely hilarious to work with. You know, I think uh, we, there was a couple of a couple of the Brazilian guys. So Felipe Fragoso, who actually lives in Australia now, lives close to where I used to live in Australia. Uh, we catch up every now and again. It's it's kind of hard to to manage the schedules. You know, Joey Templin, uh, Shannon Brown, you know, I really liked working with those guys. Shahima, Suze, and Michelle were great. I mean, there were, you know, there were there were quite a few, and I, I am going to leave some out that I can't recall. But, um, I, yeah, it was, you know, you just, you had 
I mean, these are the people I guess I, I keep in contact with most, right? And you know, by most, it's a couple times a year we message back and forth, that sort of thing. And you know, it's been years since I've seen quite a few of them that are still based in North America. But yeah, I try to catch up with Joey a couple times a year, and it doesn't always work out, but yeah. Yeah, he's a yeah. hard one to pin down. Joey, if you're listening to this, you you know you're more than invited, <laughs> Joey. <laughs> no pressure, Joey. <laughs> no, he's a he's a busy guy. I know. Now, the, the, I know. The, that Sydney office is that Sydney office is yeah. really busy. Shout out um, Sydney office. That's right. Hard working yeah. people at the Sydney office. Uh, hmm. Did you ever? Just a quick question about Vegemite. Did you, have you acquired a taste for it? Uh, yes or no. So funny story about Vegemite. And when I was at Penn State, one of the one of the the athletic trainers, you know, so we would we would be on these these you know weightlifting programs and stuff like that. So one of the trainers at Penn State, actually one of my teammates, she was a she was an Australian. She came from Melbourne, and um, had brought Vegemite. So one of the trainers was just eating it with a spoon. And you don't do that. Oh, but no, I was you, yeah. You, know, you got to put it on toast, right? Or mm. bread. <laughs> Spar yeah, sparingly on sparingly on toast with a lot of butter. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so so anyway, I, I she she offered some in, in like a training session. I took took a spoon and just took a bite, thinking, you know, it's brown, it looks it's a you know, you put it on stuff, it's I'm gonna it's gonna be kind of sweet. And it wasn't, you know, it was salty yeah. and just at that <laughs> stage it was it was the grossest thing I'd ever put in my mouth. Cut to, you know, a couple of years down the track here, and I have it properly in Australia on toast and with butter, and it's it's great. And yeah, absolutely love it. There was a there was a stage where my son would just like he would he would just go mental for Vegemite. He just oh, loved wow. it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, to, each, to each their own. And so yeah, we've <laughs> That's it. Like it's uh, it, but it was an acquired taste. I have acquired the taste. Yeah, have converted a few people in my family as well. So my dad now buys it off of Amazon and has oh it every morning. Of all the things yeah. I bought off Amazon, I'll tell you now, I will never ever buy Vegemite. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Sorry. No, I mean I did try it. Okay, I did give it a shot. But I, it, when I was at Lindemann Island, I was the guy always putting the cat back on because it was rather pungent, and they would put it out for breakfast. Mm. So when no one was looking, I would like screw that yellow cat back on. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it does. It does have a it does have a smell to it. Yeah. <laughs> is there? A, tell me, is there anything like since you left Club Med in two thousand six? Is there anything that that you miss? Like, do you find yourself? I mean, you live in a pretty cool country. You don't have much winter, so I'm wondering, uh, is mm -hmm. there any anything at all that you miss about Club Med? I guess with with the club specifically, I miss you know I miss the people. Like it's, it was the GOs working there. You'd get, you know, you'd be able to talk to some, you know, the, okay. So I guess first the GOs, I really miss, you know, having, having that sort of shared sense of, of purpose and, and camaraderie, you really develop some, some fast friendships and, and you had just, you just have a lot of fun throughout a season with, with everybody. The guests that you would get at the, the villages, you know, you, some were great, some were amazing. And you just, you know, in, in Punta Cana, I remember we had two, uh, two, two sort of very interesting memories come out from some of the guests. So the first was this, um, this guy who was, he worked for the BBC. And he was just, just really fascinating to talk to. And so I would spend, we would shut down the restaurant every night, his family and I just having a chat and talking, you know, and so I actually got in trouble a couple of times because I wasn't, I'd skip a show or skip something, you know, to just keep talking with this guy. It was just really, really fascinating. The second, the second sort of memory around the guests was we had at Punta Cana that year, we had, there were two, two professional French soccer players. And uh, one was actually, he had actually been capped on the French national team. So he played internationally for France, I think a handful of times. But yeah, we just, you know, spent a lot of time hanging out with these guys, chatting, playing sports. Like they were, you know, obviously really into the sports. And then one night we we played soccer with them on the basketball court. So we set up like a, you know, just a hard court soccer match. And and you know, we thought we put together a pretty decent little team. <laughs> we might hold our own, but 
my gosh, it, it, these guys just, they, they wiped the floor with us. It wasn't even like one of the guys that, that was at the village was a GO had actually been recruited to go play uh, for a youth development program in Switzerland somewhere. So he was, he was a pretty good soccer player and some of the other GOs, you know, we had some Italian GOs and things. So they, we had some, we thought we had some talent and, uh, Yeah, these these French guys just absolutely showed us what was what. It was it was embarrassing, but yeah, that was a lot of fun. Like so so like I miss the geos, miss some of the guests that you get to talk to. You know, you just have this range of conversations and and people from all walks of life coming through, which was great. And and then obviously the snow. Like today it'll be thirty. Oh, okay. You, Today okay. it'll be thirty degrees and sunny. Okay. You lost, you lost me there. So, yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm calling Matt from Montreal. He's in Australia and uh, it, but anyway, no, no, that's all. Those are all great. To, yeah. I miss like you. Those are the things I miss as well. Yeah. Yeah, I thought I'd miss, you know, I, I like I do miss skiing. I miss skiing in general. You know, it's it's one of those things that's accessible kind of down here. You know, the great thing is that Japan is not too far away. You know, for an Aussie, uh, like a 10 hour flight is that's 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 short distance. And so to get up to Japan is is not too bad. Yeah, you can So go see looking. you can go ski with Rebel. I know he's based That's in Japan, exactly right? it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you know that that sort of thing is is now possible, but yeah, you know, I it's uh it was really the the people and the conversations that you'd have and just yeah, just in general the people like it was it was so much fun. Okay, Matt, another question about the ski seasons. It's come to my attention that and unbeknownst to me that Ski instructors usually had the same day off, and it was almost always on a Wednesday. Is this true or false? Yeah, so at at Crested, what was really interesting, and I, I, you know, I only found out how unique this was when I went down to to Punta Cana. But yeah, the ski school would shut down on Wednesday. I'm not sure what the reason was, but the the we, you know, the the resort built it as as family day, so it was the day that you'd ski with your family and you know do whatever, go on an excursion. I don't know if they had. I'm sure they had excursions in Crested Butte. But what was really cool about that first season, for whatever reason, like. the storms just kind of lined up. And so like Monday, Tuesday, you know, a storm would roll in, we would get a lot of fresh snow and then we'd all have Wednesday off. So we, we would just go and ski from, you know, early morning to, to basically when the lifts closed. And then because we didn't have any, any duties at the village that day, we would go into town and, and have dinner. Crested was, was great because the, the actual, The town itself had a lot of these really cool little restaurants. I mean, it was a, you know, maybe five, six thousand people lived in the town, and there were I don't know, fifty restaurants, something like that. And one of the favorites was this place called the Secret Stash Pizza. It was a really like they made some some really good pizza, and it seemed like every Wednesday, you'd ski all day, your legs would be jelly, you go have a couple of beers, and then you go into town for dinner with with all all the other instructors. It was just, yeah, it was, it was, it was really great. And then, yeah, getting down to Punta Cana and then having to, to either coordinate days off or, you know, be off when no, nobody else was off was, was it was an adjustment. And so you, you taking that, you know, going back then to Crested Butte later that, or for the second season, you really took advantage of those, those Wednesdays off with everybody else. Yeah, I'll, I'll bet it was uh, was uh, an adjustment when you went from yeah to Punta next, yeah, because it's very rare if you'd have a day off with, with your friend, right? And here you were interested, you know, that must have been uh, pretty special, all those people together in one room. Yeah, it was really good. And, you know, because they were all, they were all really good skiers. Like you just, you had people that, you, you know, you, you weren't waiting, you weren't, you know, you, people were pushing you, you weren't, you know, you were in a really good group of really motivated people. Yeah, it was just a lot of fun. Would you put any of the villages ahead of one another? If I asked you if you had a magical season, was it your first one because it was the first one or you just like the ball in different ways? It's a good question. I think like, like the first season, because it was, because it was all new, I think was great. I, I think I had, I had a lot of different fun in Punta Cana. You know, we would get out of the village more. It was, you know, it was a very different experience. The guests were different. The activities were different. You know, the team was was a bit more global. 
but yeah, I think that first season was just was just outstanding. Like stars lined up with uh, the Geo team, you know, the snow being new. Uh, it was just the the chief. Everything was just lined up. It was just great. And I'm guessing you're you're glad that you had that conversation with your dad, who told you about his coworkers' kids. Like I'm I'm assuming you had a you had a great time and don't regret, you know, trying it out, right? Yeah, absolutely no regrets with it. It was funny the at the at the time I was looking to go out to Club Med. I was also I had also interviewed for a ski ski school position with a it was a U.S. military resort in Garmisch Partenkirchen, uh, so excuse in, me, in but southern excuse Germany. Me, Matt, Matt, excuse me. Okay, you just you just dropped a, an interesting nugget there. Can you repeat that yeah. again? A, a military what yeah. School? So it's like a, a a U.S. Army resort. When you say resort, so I guess it, what, what, what do you mean? Yeah. So I guess it was a place where if you had, if you had like, uh, what do they call it? Like leave or you had uh, time off when you were in the military, you could go to these places with your family for, I guess, for, for, uh, you know, discounted sort of holiday. And I, you know, this was the first I'd ever heard of it, this one in Garmish. But I had, yeah, interviewed with with them and and had an offer, and I don't know what it was about. You know, I chose Club Med, I think because it was probably going to be a bit more lighthearted and <laughs> yeah, seemingly a bit more I, fun. I, I'd say, <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, like at the at the time, like like you know, I I think it was the pre like I probably incorrectly thought that the pressure to to you know make sure people had a good holiday for army guys going to you know going to going to war in afghanistan or iraq at the time that was a bit much and i wasn't ready to kind of handle that one so like you know it's like if i thought they had a bad lesson you know that that was that was um that was a bit too much to bear so i'm very very happy to have chosen club med i think it was yeah in the end i think it was the, the right choice yeah, the stakes are a lot lower in, in the Club Med decision, yeah. that's for sure, right? If you yeah. Have a, if you have a bad water aerobics class, eh, you, you, you know, you have six other days yeah, a week just, to do them. <laughs> that's it. Just go to the bar, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. It's raining, yeah. so what? The bar is open. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that was um that was an interesting one. I hadn't I hadn't thought about that decision for quite a while. So yeah, it was a great well, question. You're the only XGO in three years that ever has ever had to make that decision. Because I've never heard of this before. That uh, there are actual resorts for the uh, armed services. I didn't know that. So and that you, you know, were considering it. That's pretty incredible. I just like I really just wanted to, you know, Club Med at the time for me was like, oh, you know, maybe it's Colorado and then it'll be, you know, go teach in France or something. And and the the armed forces resort was already in southern germany so it was like oh that would be really cool but yeah i'm very very happy with with the decisions i made and you know it's, it's got me down to australia and uh you know everything i've gotten today is is kind of attributable to the people i met along the way and uh some of the decisions i made as a ski instructor and with with the club well well said sir well said and uh that uh, that's a perfect spot to end it there so we Really want to thank you for sharing your story with us here today, Matt. Thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate it, Greg. Thank you very much for having me. And um, yeah, I'll shout out to Shahima and and everybody else from from those uh, from those villages. I had yeah, just a tremendous tremendous couple of years in my life. Like you know, really good memories on on everything. Well, yeah, and uh, you it sounded like you you met a lot of you met a lot of great people and you know friends you're still in contact today with, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, probably not as regular as I I would like to be, but that's just the way I I think that's just the way it goes. But, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, that that yeah. time difference with Australia and say the East Coast <laughs> is uh, it's, it's yeah. rough. It's kind of rough. <laughs> not gonna lie. <laughs> No, that's exactly it. That time difference is is nuts down here. I mean, I have now had, yeah, seventeen Super Bowl Mondays. No, sorry, sixteen because I came right. down here in yeah. April. Yeah. What's it, what's it like drinking beer at eight a.m., Matt? Don't answer that. Okay, okay. I went to Penn State. It's uh, <laughs> okay. it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah.
But no, it's a it's an interesting thing. And that time zone, yeah, it does yeah, I, it makes a difference. I remember my uh, my one Super Bowl when I was at Lindemann. Yeah, it was ungodly early, and I'm like, <laughs> drinking beer at eight a.m. Yes, okay. But you, <laughs> yeah, you're with the club at the time. It's okay. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's all good. <laughs> Oh, Matt, well, thank you so much for taking this trip down memory lane. Thank you, sir. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, thanks, Greg. Thanks for setting this up. This has been a lot of fun. My pleasure, sir. And uh, that was the one and only Matt Gillig, everyone. I'm going to have you say goodbye to everyone. Take us out, Matt. Is that okay? That's great. Yeah, thanks, everyone, for, for listening. And um, yeah, Greg, thanks for thanks for giving me the opportunity to tell my, my club head stories. And uh yeah, looking forward to looking forward to listening to this and look, listening to the the other pods. Well, thank you, sir. All right, everyone. That was Matt, and we'll see you all here next week. Bye.